All right, I think we'll start. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Rudder from Penn State Barron. Um, I'd like uh, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, Lion Lessons. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind everybody that this session is being recorded, um, so that just everybody is aware of that. Um, and so tonight, I'm going to talk to you about. Um, how to rank anything, and although the, the, the title is how to rank anything, uh, this is going to be a talk that centers around sports. And so um, there will be a couple mentions of some other things, but we're going to talk about sports mostly and how, how people rank sports. Um, I, I do want to start out by uh, introducing myself a little bit. Um, my official title is Associate Professor of Statistics. I've been at Barron, this is my 18th year at Penn State Barron. Um, and so I, I teach a number of statistics, to, of statistics classes, both freshman level stat classes and upper level. Um, I'm also the associate director of the School of Science, um, which means I'm uh, also part administrator, um, dealing with things on the student side of things in terms of, um, you know, recruiting and asking questions and helping students schedule and things like that. And so lots of lots of duties associated with that as well. Um, since this is a sports talk, I figured it would be good to uh, indicate a little bit where my where my um, my fandom lies. I grew up in West New York, um, so I am a Sabres and Bills fan. Um, those are my two biggest teams, and my life is full of disappointment for those two teams. Um, I'm also a Red Sox fan because we didn't have baseball in Buffalo when I was growing up, and so I became a Red Sox fan. And for much of my life, that too is disappointing, but that has turned out um, better in the past in the past 10 years than it was before, so that's good. Um, I am a big soccer slash football fan, and so my two favorite teams are Newcastle United in England, who aren't very good right now, and Borussia Dortmund, who is pretty good. They play in the uh, German Bundesliga. Um, so they're my, they're my two favorite soccer teams. Um, I'm also a big fan of Penn State, obviously, and I did a lot of my graduate work at Michigan State, and I was a graduate student there um, when Michigan State won their um, NCAA basketball tournament with Mateen Cleaves and company. So I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of Michigan State and still follow them pretty closely. Um, so we dive in. I want to I want to make a distinction between um, ratings and rankings. Um, those two, two terms are close, but I think it's important we define what they are. So the rating is the actual numeric value that indicates the quality of a team or a player. So that's some number that we associate with the team. Um, in most cases, although there are exceptions, usually the bigger the rating, the better the team is, the better the person is. And these numbers are based on a model or a formula. If they're based on a model, they, they probably mean something. Um, if it's based on a formula that's just, that just kind of exists out there, we'll see an example of that. It might not mean much at all other than just a number. The thing that people talk about more often, though, is the rankings, um, which is just a sorted list of those ratings. And um, that's the value that people like to discuss. Who's the number one ranked team? Um, who's the number one ranked player in the world? The actual rating is where all the math and all the magic happens, but the ranking is what people end up talking about. So we'll, we'll talk about both of those in a sense, but the rating is the part that we're going to be interested in tonight. Um, why do we need these rankings? Um, well, obviously, there's always this discussion as to what the best team or what the best player is. And so that, that's a fundamental thing and the reason why we tend to rank things. Um, in many cases, especially in collegiate sports, we have to determine which teams or which players should make a postseason tournament. Uh, we are in the middle of March Madness right now. And so as we get closer to March, there's always a discussion of which team should make the NCAA uh, Division One basketball tournament, which teams are on the bubble, which teams don't make it. So th these are discussions that we have that, that are quite popular among people who follow sports. Um, and when, when schedules are not balanced or the number of teams is so large, it's impossible for every team to play every other team, the rankings become even more important because there's no way, and, and I'll show a slide about this in a second, that all the NCAA Division One basketball teams can play each other. So having some metric that compares teams that haven't played each other is, is an important concept when deciding these postseason tournaments. Now, I, I do want to make a couple comments about leagues. Um, in my opinion, there is, there is, there's definitely a best league, and that is the English Premier League when it comes to schedules. This is schedule-wise. And by the way, this, this, this is every, pretty much every European soccer league um, follows the same rules. Um, each, each team during a season plays each other home and away. 
Um, so they play each other twice, once, once, once in their spot and the, and then once it, you know, away. So that's very, very fair. Um, there's three points for a win, one point for a tie. And at the end of the season, whoever has the most points wins. And so that's a very balanced schedule. Can't get any more balanced than that, playing everybody home and away. So in this particular system really isn't a need for a ranking system at the end. Um, now you might want to use one in the middle of the season when you're trying to figure out, you know, when everyone's schedule has to been completely finished yet, but, but at the end, there really isn't a discussion. The team with the most points is definitely the best team. Now in the United States, we have what I like to call unbalanced leagues. Um, those would be things like the NBA and the NHL, um, when it's not uh, in the middle of a pandemic in which every team plays every other team that still happens. However, due to the fact that North America is really large, um, teams and divisions uh, that are geographically located next to each other, they play each other more often. Just makes sense. Um, costs money to travel, um, and, and you want to have rivalries that are close to you. Um, one of the advantages of the um, England, England uh, Premier League is that England's not a very big space, and so travel is relatively easy. Uh, it's one time zone, so travel is not a big deal for all of those teams. The United States, you know, traveling back and forth to coast to coast makes it difficult. But you at least get to play everybody, but, but you might play teams that are located in your division, you know, twice as much or maybe even four times as much as you play other teams. Um, in these two cases of the NBA and the NHL, the playoffs are big enough such that this, this difference in scheduling is somewhat mitigated because um, they take eight teams per per conference, 16 teams total. Um, but but still is an issue that you know the teams that they're comparing do not have the same exact schedule. Um, Major League Baseball was unbalanced, um, but then they added interleague play. And then all of a sudden, not only did it become unbalanced, not everybody played everybody the same. And so Major League Baseball has not kind of stepped away from this designation. Um, I just want to make a quick uh, aside here for a personal pet peeve. Uh, on the use of points, like in the NHL and in soccer, um, when they, when they, when you determine satisfy, when you determine, determine standings by points. Um, in hockey, a win is worth two points, um, unless there's a tie and it goes to overtime, and then the winner gets two points, and then the loser gets a point. So all of a sudden, a game goes from being worth two points, then some of them are worth three points. So you're manufacturing points. Soccer is the opposite you get a three points for a win, but if it's a tie, only two points are given out. And so there's not a conservation of points. And so they should just make these things such that, you know, uh, if a game is worth three points, three points should be awarded regardless of how it works. So if hockey, every game is worth three points, if it's two points, if it goes to overtime for a win and then a loss in overtime, but then a win in regulation should be three points. You should have conservation of points, just it's mathematically more sound that way. That's just a personal pet peeve. So I just want to mention that. Um, college sports are an excellent example of where you have way too many teams that there's no way that they can all play each other. And so this is where a, a ranking system or a rating system is even more important. Um, for example, um, there are 350 teams currently in NCAA Division I college basketball spread across 32 different conferences. Um, and so of the 68 teams that make the tournament, that's 19.4% that's of all Division I basketball teams make the NCAA tournament. So yes, 32 of those bids are automatic, um, but, but we still need to determine what the rest of the at-large bids are. And so a ranking system can be useful for that, especially when teams have never played each other um, because these teams play mostly play games in their conference. Um, in the NCAA Division I college football, there's 130 teams across 10 conferences, um, but only 3.1% make the NCAA uh, football playoff. It's four, and there's a committee of people that decide which four of those are. So again, the ability to ask the question, which team is ranked better than another team when they haven't played each other becomes even more important. Um, and so again, it's important to note that that when these schedules are written, um, there's a combination of conference games, teams that you play in your conference that you play every year, and then there is some non-conference games. And those non-conference games are important because it allows teams in different conferences to mix. Um, you, we, we've seen this this year um, due to the pandemic where teams play only conference games. Uh, it's really difficult to compare, say, the Big Ten football season to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the SEC to the Pac-12 just because they haven't they haven't have any crossover games um, during a regular football season. Those crossover games are really important because it allows us to scale the leagues against each other. Um, and so, obviously, not a chance this year. But under normal years, that mixing is very important. So we're able to 
to build a network of games such that we're able to rank all of the teams. Um, and again, in college sports, you don't always play, you play your opponents home and away, especially in football, when you're playing 13 games, um, you never play a game, you never, normally you don't play a, game, a team twice. And so there's definite home field advantage that you might want to, uh, to account for. And we'll talk about how one might do that uh, later on in this talk. So I want to I want to start out by by discussing two historical systems. Um, one is called. Many people say it's ELO because it looks like an abbreviation, but it's really pronounced LO because it's actually named after a person that invented the system. Um, it was developed for chess, um, and and it has actually er, uh, there's been some resurgence in sports rankings because the website um, 538.com, who was uh, it was built by Nate Silver. Um, who, is a, who is a statistician that does a lot of work with predictions. He became very famous for predicting presidential elections. Um, and that's what 538.com corresponds to. You need 500, there's 538 electoral college votes. Um, but they do a lot of stuff on uh, ranking college football, pro football, basketball teams, et cetera, um, European soccer teams. And they use, they use LO for that. And so um, they have a really, really nice webpage. If you go look for that, um, describes how they do the system. I'll describe it a little bit as well, um, but they do a really nice job with that. So that, that I wanna talk about how that works. Um, and then I wanna talk about something that's not really used much anymore, but it was used for a while. It's called the Rating Percentage Index, RPI. Um, it, is you, it was used by the NCAA since the early 1980s. Um, this was often a big discussion around March Madness time. Um, it's been recently replaced with something called NET. Um, I think it says for the NCAA evaluation um, team or something along those lines, which is a mixture of different things, um, some of which are proprietary. No one knows exactly how they work. But I do want to talk about RPI um, just as a, as a reference about how not to create a ranking system. Um, so LO, the LO rating system, which is actually, honestly, it's really clever. Um, it was developed by a gentleman named Arpet Elo, um, who was a Hungarian-American physics professor in the 1960s. Um, and it was developed for the chess world. Um, and chess, the chess world is even, you know, if you think about it, it it's even a more difficult thing to get your head around than, say, uh, NCAA college basketball. Um, there's tens of thousands of players of chess. And, and they're all over the world and they don't play each other. And, and so you have to kind of come up with a ranking system that works quickly and, and is able to include that many people. And it has to be decentralized. Um, what I mean by that is that when a player walks into a chess tournament, they have a certain ELO rating and they play a series of games. When, they, when they're done, they want to have a new ELO rating. Um, if they did really well, they want their ELO rating to go up. If they did really poorly, maybe their ELO rating goes down. But um, but you can't, you can't send the results into a, a central computer and, have, and wait and have it spit it back. It needs to be done, needs to be done right away. And so um, this was a really clever way of creating the system. Um, and so this is how it works. And, and I'm gonna, gonna say that, yep, we're gonna see some equations here. Um, if you have any questions, please, when we get down to the math part of things, let me know and, I, and I'm happy to answer them. So you can just speak up and I, and I will hear you. Um, when a player enters the chess world, they enter with a rating of a thousand. It's an arbitrary number, um, but a, a thousand is supposedly supposed to be the beginner, the beginner value. Um, it's not necessarily the average value player, but it's the, play, the rating of a player that's beginning. Um, when they play another player, um, you can calculate the probability of beating that player with the following formula. So the probability that player one wins. It's one over um, one plus um, something raised to the 10th power. So it's the, it's the difference in the ratings. Um, and so if this is a, if, if player two is, is better than player one, this ends up being a positive number. And so the probability that player one wins is, is less than 50%. Um, if player one is better, then this ends up being a negative number and it ends up that, that, that the probability that player one wins is over 50%. Um, and, and roughly this comes from um, what in statistics we call a normal distribution um, or a bell-shaped curve. It's kind of an approximation of that. Um, but, but it allows you to calculate the probability of one player beating another player based upon their ratings. So, so you, you're armed with that information. So what, what do you do with that? Well, 
if player two, and just as an example, if player two has a rating of uh, 1,200, so a difference of 200, that means player one had a 24% chance because their rating was 1,000. Um, and player two has a 76% chance of winning that chess match. Yeah. Now, um, if player two wins, it's what was expected. And so the rating shouldn't change that much because yeah, someone with a 1200 rating should beat someone with a 1000 rating. So, so the system has to be like, well, if we see results that, that are expected, nothing should change. However, if player one wins, then, then that's a sign that perhaps um, that the play, ranking for player two was too high and the ranking for player one was too low. And so they should get closer to each other and you should reflect the ability of each of those players. Okay. Now, it's important to note that that the way ELO works is that it 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 you update it every single time you play a game. And so the history of all the games you've played before are kind of in your ELO number, whatever that 1200 or that 1000, or if you're a grandmaster, 2300. Um, but, but you update it every time you play a game, and, and here's how it updates. So the, the rating is updated by looking at the difference of the outcome, which I'm going to call E in a second. And so E if E is one if the player wins. Um, it's zero if the player if the player loses. And since you can have draws in chess, um, it's 0.5 for a draw. Um, obviously, if, if you're ranking something that doesn't have uh, ties or draws, then you just do it a one or a zero. Okay. And then you base this on the predicted probability of winning. And so the formula for this is the new ranking. R prime is the old ranking um, plus some something called K, which is the K factor, which which determines how much of an impact the 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 result has on the new rating, times the difference between what the expected value was and the predicted probability of winning. Okay, so this is a measure of how much that that should change. Okay, that's that's the way that works. Now. We'll see this in our example as to how this how this actually adjusts the ratings. Okay, so assume that the player, assuming that K is thirty, which is pretty common for some chess federations. So there are two cases for player one. Okay, remember the probability of player one is twenty four percent. Okay, now if they lose the game, player one's E value is zero. So zero minus 0.24 small and negative. And so you multiply that point, negative 0.24 times the 30. And so you get a small number, which is around here is seven. And so you track seven from the original rating. And so when the player one loses that game, the rating goes down to 993. Okay. So what not a big deal. They were kind of supposed to lose that game. So their player rating goes down. However, if they win one minus 0.24 is a positive number. And so again, if you look at that formula, if, if K, if E minus P is positive, that means the ranking is gonna go up. And so since one minus 0.24 is large and positive, you multiply it by that 30, then it adds 23 points to their rating. And again, so you can see that if that probability of winning was small and it gets even smaller because you know the, the ratings of the, the people playing was even further apart and they pull an upset, then their new LO rating is going to be even higher as, as that as that difference is there. So so you adjust the, the player's rating after every game. Um, players two, by the way, there's a conservation of points here. Um, player two's new rating, if they beat the person that had a 1,000 ranking, is now 1,207. So they get the seven points that the player lost. And then if they if player two loses that game, then their new rating becomes 1,177. So they lose the 23 points that, that the first player gained. So there's a conservation of points here, which is nice. Okay, And so you can update, the, update that rating as you go. And again, since chess had to do it in a decentralized sense that like, you know, hey, I played these four games and in this tournament, I need to do need to know my ELO rating as I leave the place, the ELO rating as I leave, then these are relatively straightforward calculations you can do so that people know what their new rating is at the end of the day. So it was a really good system for that. Um, one thing to talk about is K. K is, is completely arbitrary. Um, there is no, there's no rhyme or reason why you should set K except for how you want to do things. So 
different chess federations do different values. And, and, and a lot of times they're based upon how good or how new the players are. For example, they'll put a high rating of K, like a 30 or 32, um, when there's new players, so they can better reflect um, quick changes. So if a player runs, new player wins a bunch of games, the rating is gonna go up really quick because K is really high. Um, while grandmasters with those that have ratings up above 2,300, um, really, really great players. I think they believe, they be, I believe they use a K value of seven. Um, because it, they don't want them to move that much. And so that, that's how that is. Um, 538.com uses a value of 20 for their NFL games. And they use a bunch of other things as well. Um, but, but that's the value that they use there. Um, and, so, and so speaking of, of what um, 538 does, and they do something that's really nice, is they actually go back and they look at the, um, the, the history of, of every team. So this is this is we're we're in Pennsylvania, so I wanted to look at the Steelers' um, lifetime LO rating, um, and you can see here. This is a really nice chart. Um, they have uh, they have gold circles when they won uh, Super Bowl championships. By the way, in the in the LO ratings for five thirty eight, um, a team has, is average if their LO rating is fifteen hundred, and they start and they start new teams at like thirteen hundred. So when when the Steelers end became when they started to exist, um, that's what they gave them that particular rating or something close to that and then you can see the rating over time so you can see as they won super bowl championships um they got better okay and then they won again in the you know in in the uh 2000s again you can see their lo rating is pretty high you can see the lo rating at the end of the season for the uh for the steelers who lost a number of games um at the end you can see their LO, lo rating diving and moving back down towards the average um for equal time um i i, I looked at the lo rating for my buffalo bills um it's interesting to note that that the current maximum LO rating that the Bills have ever had in their entire lifetime was actually two games ago um, when they beat Baltimore in in the uh, divisional round of the playoffs that gave them their highest LO rating ever, which is interesting since they went to four Super Bowls in a row, their rating wasn't as good back then as it is was now or at the end of that Baltimore game, which is interesting. Um, but again, you can see the different ranges here. Some years they were bad. Some years they were pretty good. Uh, I should point out there are two there are two wins back here, but that was for the old AFL championships before the merger. And so those are not Super Bowl wins because as we know, the Bills have never won a Super Bowl. Um, so I strongly encourage you, if you're interested in this, to go check out um, 538.com. Those are all, it's all words when you spent it out. Because again, you can go look at a variety of teams. You can go look at their, um, at their ratings. Um, in the background here, you can see uh, these are the ratings for the, all the teams in the league. And so up here, this is when the Patriots were undefeated um, that one year. And so just before the Super Bowl, when they hadn't lost a game, they had the highest LO rating for football ever. Um, and I think it, you know, it, it pretty clo close to 1800, a little bit over 1800. So that was the highest ever. So it's interesting to see that those results over time. So neat, neat stuff to look at these plots for the teams over time. Um, the other thing I want to talk about before I, before I get into how one might rate something on a local level um, is the rating percentage index. Um, this was, again, developed by the NCAA or developed in conjunction with the NCAA, um, and they, use it for, they, they used it for um, a number of different sports, especially the team sports in which they had to narrow down teams to get to the playoffs. Um, it starts out simple, you know, you look at a team's win percentage, that's a decent indicator of how, what the quality of the team is. Um, however, if a team only plays bad teams, then their win percentage doesn't indicate the quality of their schedule. So, so the rating percentage index was developed to, um, to take into account strength of schedule. Now, LO does that in the sense that if you beat a bad team, your LO rating isn't gonna go up very much. So LO really benefits from beating good teams. And if you beat a team, if you lose to a team that has a similar rating that you have, your LO value isn't going to adjust that much. Um, so RPI tended to wanted to come up with a way to, to, to emulate that, but without using those complicated mathematical formulas. Um, so calculating RPI is relatively simple on the surface. Actually, there's one little hitch I'll pull out here at the last part of this slide. Um, it consists of three components. So you take your win percentage and you multiply that by 25%. So essentially it's a weighted average. So we're gonna take, we're gonna take the, the, um, the average of, our, of the win percentage of the team of interest, give that 25%. Then you take the opponent's winning percentage. So you, you sum up all the wins and losses of its opponents, calculate that win percentage and you give that a weight of 50%. So if you're playing teams that are really good 
and have a strong strength of schedule, then you'll you'll get a bonus for that. If you're playing a bunch of weak teams, then their 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 winning percentage might not be very good, and so you won't you'll get penalized for that. Um, you'll notice that only sums to 75 percent, and so what you do is you take the opponent's opponent's winning percentage, and you multiply that by 25 percent because there's a chance that the reason why the team you played had a really bad schedule or has a really bad win percentage is because they're only playing good teams, and so this takes into account. Um, this is kind of like a three level. You take yours, the strength of schedule of the people that you played and the strength of schedule of the people that they played. And so it, it incorporates it on those three levels. Um, the thing that makes this a tricky thing to do is that games against the team being ranked are not included in the second and third components. So this actually turns out to be a pretty complicated formula to calculate because you got to take out the games against the team that you're trying to come up with the RPI for. Um, but there's an algorithm for it. It's relatively straightforward. You can calculate it, but it's a, it's not, it's not as straightforward as the formula seems. Um, there's some facts about RPI that kind of bring it into question. Um, the weights are completely arbitrary. Um, those were the weights that they used for college basketball for the longest time. But if you look at different sports, there are different weights. Again, completely arbitrary. Um, as I said, different sports use different weights, which is weird. I don't know why college hockey should have different weights than college basketball. Um, one strange mathematical quirk is that if a really good team with a high win percentage beats a really bad team that doesn't have very many wins, RPI actually goes down. Um, this happens because if you have a conference schedule and you're forced to play all the teams in your conference and some of the conference teams are bad, your RPI will go down even though there's a game that you didn't have a choice to play, you had to play it. Um, I always felt that was a functional flaw of RPI was that um, you shouldn't win a game and have your rating go down. That doesn't make any sense. And so, and so that, that's always been a flaw of this particular system. Um, and there's no built-in rewards for beating team on the road because, you know, winning percentage doesn't really care where you got things. Um, and there's no predictive ability. Unlike uh, LO and what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, um, it's just a number. You can't make any predictions based on what's going on in this team. So, so not mathematical, not a model-based thing. It's just a formula. Um, this is curious. This is this was the D1 basketball RPI um, just prior to the NCAA tournament this year. And as you can see, if you're familiar with what's going on right now, Gonzaga undefeated um, has the highest RPI rating, which makes sense. Um, Houston um, in the in the Final Four, uh, Baylor in the Final Four. They're actually tied um, for for a, an RPI rating of, of 633. Now I was just going to show the top 10 of these, but I it was important to note that um, the bottom the top 10 and 11 were St. Bonaventure and Colgate. Um, St. Bonaventure was an eight or a nine seed in the NCAA tournament, and Colgate was actually a 14 seed. Colgate didn't play very many games against non-conference opponents, yet their RPI says they're 0.615. No way that, that Colgate, a 14 seed, uh, which means it was probably the 48th best team in the whole tournament, should be ranked 11th by RPI. So um, a real good example of, of some of the flaws that are in this system. Um, so that's an interesting, note. again, San Diego State, BYU, really high, but not necessarily that good a team. So RPI has some serious flaws in it. Um, the NCAA tweaked this over time um, in order to address some of these issues. Uh, they, they decided to reward people for road wins and kind of penalize people for home wins. Um, so they gave 1.4. Uh, it was worth 1.4 games for road win and 0.6 for a home win. Again, completely arbitrary. Um, they, and they started looking at things they called quadrants. So what was your RPI against teams in the top 30? Or what was your record against RPI teams in RPI top 30, top 50, top 100? So they started, they started breaking things out because they knew there were some flaws in the system. And again, and, and as I mentioned before, in 2018, they stopped using the system or they started using other things as well. Um, and, so, and so it has kind of gone by the wayside. But again, a good example of what can go wrong with, with a ranking system. So, um, what I want to do is I want to show you and we actually do some examples of of what a model banked rating, a model based ranking system might look like. Um, and in some respects, how simple it can be and how quickly you can make it complicated. Um, there's a number of um, well known systems that are for ranking college sports teams and concentrating college sports teams again, because those tend to be the ones where this becomes the most important discussion. Um, there's the uh, Sagarin ratings, which are found in USA Today, and they've been there for as long as I can remember, so 30 years or so. Um, another one that's that's been popular recently is the Ken Palm or the Pomeroy rankings. 
um, or ratings. And um, they're often used, often cited when trying to figure out what team should go to the uh, bowl championship series um, for those four teams in the NCAA division one football. Um, and so, so th these are very popular systems. You can find them on the web. You can find them in the USA today, um, but they're proprietary. Um, these gentlemen, um, they, they do really good work, um, but, but if they let everybody know exactly how the system would work, um, then people could copy it and they wouldn't, they wouldn't re keep the financial reward that they somewhat deserve. And so, and so no one really knows exactly how they work. We have some inclinations how they work because we look at the numbers and we can see how they work. But there's some, there's some secret sauce going on in there. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is a model that is, is, might not be exactly the same as those ratings are, but it's really close. Um, and there's tweaks that you can do with it, and there's other things you can do with it, but this is the basis of what, what they do. Um, and the model I'm going to describe is called the Bradley Terry model. Um, it was created in 1952, and honestly, it was created to compare uh, journals. They, someone wanted to figure out what was the best journal. Um, and so these are called pairwise rankings. And so what that means is um, you give an evaluator two things, and you ask them a very simple question. Which one do you think is better? And they repeat this over and over again. And so it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be sports teams. It could be anything. So you can rank movies, you can rank candy bars, you can rate at the time when this was developed, they were ranking journals. What's the best psychology journal? Well, you know, is it journal A or journal B? And someone go, well, I think it's journal A. And so you just ask that question. Um, this is, a, in many ways, it's a lot easier for an evaluator to sit down. If you give them two things, a simple question to go, which one of these two is the best? That's an easy answer, an easier question to answer. If you give them 10 things and you say, rank these from one to 10, that can be a little bit harder. But giving them two things, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier. And so um, this method allows for multiple evaluators. So you don't have to rely on just one person. You can rely on lots of different people to get lots of different opinions. They can look at the same two things they're comparing and they compare a whole bunch of things in random ways. And eventually you take all this data and you throw it into a model and you'll end up with a rating a uh, rating for each thing you're, you're evaluating, and then you put those ratings in order, and now you have a ranking. And so that's what the Bradley Terry, Terry model is. It's really flexible. And given the fact it's comparing two things, it's easily extended to sports because every game is a comparison between two things. Um, it's a very simple model. Um, every team is assigned a rating, as we've talked about. And um, in this, I'm just going to call it theta. So the Greek letter theta. So they have a value of theta. Um, the better a team, the higher the value of theta. Now, usually a value of theta of 100 means your average, although you can rescale that to be anything you want. Um, but, but typically 100 is an average value for an average team, okay? Um, and then again, after you determine all these values of theta, you can rank them for highest to lowest. So here's the way the model works. Um, the probability that team A defeats team B, probability that A wins is theta A over theta A plus theta B. So real simple, okay? You give me two ratings, I can calculate the probability that A wins. And just as easily, um, I can calculate the probability that B wins if, if it's just theta B over the sum of those two thetas, okay? So for example, um, if say team A has a rating of 138, so they're above average team, um, and team B has a rating of 19, so a below average team, um, what are the probabilities of winning? Well, 138 over 138 plus 19, 88% that team A wins, and then obviously 12% that team B wins because 19 over the sum of those two numbers gets you 12%. So if you know the team's ratings, um, then you, it's easy to predict the probability of those, of those two teams winning. So it's much like LO in the sense that if I give you the two, te two teams range, you can calculate the probability of winning. This formula, a little bit easier than the one that we saw before, but that's that's the general idea. Okay, so that really simple model. Okay, um, there's some assumptions of this model. Okay, in the way that it's written, you can't have a tie as a possible outcome because you only have a winner or a loser. We'll come back to that. How we'll actually come back to all of this. Um, the way it's written, there's no home field or home court advantage. Um, that's easy to add, but but it's not written in this model. Okay. Um, most importantly, the margin of victory is not included. The only thing that we care about here is that we have a winner or a loser. Um, and, um, and, and we'll come back to these, as I say, later, because we'll talk about how you can adjust this model to include these complexities. Okay. Now, the, the tricky part is, OK, I have a bunch of games. I don't know what the values of theta are. 
I need to figure out what, what the values are going to be based on a bunch of data. That's a statistics problem. If you give me a bunch of observations, I have to estimate what those values of theta are. That becomes a statistics problem. Um, and so you have to estimate a value of theta for each team based on those results that you have, okay? And so that's, that's, the, that's the mechanical part of this. Um, and unlike LO, which you can use a simple formula, um, this, this really does require a computer to solve, especially when you add things like home field advantage and, and, and other things like that. And so this becomes a little bit more complicated. And so you need a computer to solve it. Now, it turns out that, that you can do this in Excel, which I think is great because it makes it accessible. This is something, if you have a number of results, you can actually do. And so we're gonna do a quick example here. Um, of, of how this works in, in Excel. Um, hopefully everyone can see this. Um, so this is just a three team, three team league, for example. Um, team A has beaten team B three, three times to zero. Um, team A has beaten team C two, to one, two games to one. And team B has beaten team C two games to one. Okay. And so what you do is you set up these scores, okay? And over here, you have the values of theta, okay? And obviously at the beginning here, we give everyone the same value. And so if, if it's 100 over 100 plus 100, obviously everything is 50%. And so what you do is you set up the spreadsheet so that you figure out what the value of theta is for each team. Now, again, all I care about at this point is if you, it's a win or a loss. So the winning team gets a score of one and the losing team gets a score of zero. And so what the goal of this is, is we have all of these games. And right now, each game has a 50-50 chance of winning because based on these ratings. What you're trying to do is for your entire season of games, you multiply all these probabilities together. That's what this number is here, okay? Um, you multiply them all together. And the goal is to find the values of theta that make this multiplication of all of these games as high as possible. Because these are probabilities, you want these probabilities to be as high as possible to be correct. And so the way you do that is find the values of theta that maximizes these values. And since they're games, since all these games take place theoretically as a group, you multiply the probabilities together. That's why it's a really small probability because all these 50% are multiplied together. So let me show you how this works, okay? So for example, team A, obviously they only lost once, their value of rate, their value of theta should be higher. So maybe it should be 200. So notice it's originally, 0.195 and you multiply them together. So now it's 0.549. So it's gotten bigger, okay? And so we're getting closer to finding the values of theta that 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 are, you know, that correctly model these teams. Now, obviously it went up with 200, so maybe it has to go up to 400. Oh, look, 400, that got better. Notice what happens, you know, these games that were team A1 as theta increases, the probability of team A winning increased 80% because that, you know, and it happened a lot. Notice when it lost team C, it went down to 20%. Okay? And so, but you multiply all this together, the, this probability, what we call the likelihood, um, ends up getting bigger and you can increase this. Well, let me try 600. Oh, it got even bigger. So maybe, maybe the true value of theta for team A is 600, but at some point it starts becoming too big. Notice now when I put an 800, it goes back down because this, this, this outcome that team C beat team A isn't very likely if team C is ranked 100 and team A is work ranked, uh, has a rating of 800. And so you have to adjust these. Now, what makes the problem difficult is that you have to adjust all of these at the same time and go, well, maybe I need to increase the value of C. Oh, well that actually made the number go down. And so, the, the, the job the computer has to do or the algorithm that someone wrote for the computer is to figure out what values of A make this as big as possible, okay? Now, a little mathematical trick, uh, there's a problem when you have hundreds of games, um, multiplying a whole bunch of numbers between zero and one just ends up with numbers that are that's even smaller. And so we have hundreds of games, this, this number that we're trying to make as big as possible goes to zero. Um, so there's a little trick here a um, little mathematical trick that I will show you very briefly. Um, you'll notice that there's some other numbers here. And so if you're familiar with the, the rules of logs, you know the natural log of A times B is equal to natural log of A 
plus the natural log of B. So what I've actually done is I've taken the natural log of those percentages. And since they're a number less than one, the natural log is zero, or I'm sorry, less than zero or negative. Um, and then I, since I can turn the multiplication to addition, I add them up. And so that's, that's what this yellow number is here is the addition of all those numbers. It's just mathematically easier to deal with. So not a big deal. Just want to show you that that's what's going on. But I'm going to turn these back to 100 because I want to start with every team being the same. And what we use in R or in, in Excel is something called solver. And solve what solver does is very simply, um, you could point to a value, a cell and say, hey, I want to make this as big as possible by adjusting these three values. And so you hit solve. And very quickly, it generates the values for you. Okay, and so you can see what happened. Okay, um, it gave Team A a value of 214, and it gave Team B and C values of 42, um, so or 43 when you round it. Okay, so even though Team B beat Team C twice, um, because Team C did manage to pull out of upset Team A, their actual ratings were actually the same. But obviously, team A is the best, and they have a value of 214. And so you can see how this maximized this at 0.837%. Again, multiplying all these up generated that value. And again, since B and C have the same exact value, when they play, the model indicates that they have the same exact probability, 50-50 uh, chance of beating each other. So that's that's how the Bradley Taylor, Taylor Bradley Terry model works, is that it it you have to figure out what those values of theta are. Okay. Now. Um, oops, let me go back to my talk, which I've lost. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's a problem with the Bradley Terry model. Um, if, if a team has, has no losses, then the only possible value of theta is infinity um, because they have to win every game. Um, that can be strange. Um, and so we've got to be careful about that because computers have a hard time with infinity. Um, it tends to break them as the numbers get too big. So we have a problem with that. By the way, the same exact issue happens if a team has no wins. So, um, so for example, in NCAA basketball this year, Gonzaga would break this model as given because it would want their value of theta to be infinity. And so we don't like to have that happen. Um, and so this can be solved by placing upper and lower limits on the value of theta. It's an adjustment we can add to the model. And so that, 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 that saves that. Um, what about ties? Um, especially in low-scoring games, um, ties ties can occur awful lot, and this happens in hockey and soccer in particular. Um, and so um, the same thing we do in LO is that you can treat a tie as half a win and half. Oh, I wrote half a tie. It's half a win and half a loss. Okay, so you split it equally between half a win and a half a loss, and that's how we deal with ties. Um, there's other models that are more mathematically complicated that 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 you can actually model the tie as a possible outcome. Um, I did that. I, I had a I had a model that ranked um, women's college hockey teams, um, and it explicitly modeled the probability of a tie um, based upon the team's ratings. And so what that showed me is that over a number of years worth of data, um, the probability of a tie between two equally ranked teams in women's college hockey was 16.2%. Interesting number. Okay, um, and as the team's qualities, as the team theta values got further and further apart, um, the probability of a tie decreased, which makes sense. And so I was able to explicitly model the probability of a tie. So that was kind of an, a neat application of another version of this Bradley Terry model. Um, home field advantage. Um, obviously, especially in a sport like college football, where you only play, you know, you play each team once, it could be home or away, and that's a big deal. Um, you can add that to the model. Um, it's very simple. Um, there's actually two ways you can do this. Um, you just have to add a constant. If the team's playing at home, you give it some value. In this case, we call it tau. Okay. Um, and so there's two ways you can do this. You can either add it to it or you can actually multiply the value. Notice you have to do it in both the numerator and the denominator. So obviously playing at home essentially just increases the value of theta, increases the rating for that particular team. And so as part of the model fitting process, you estimate what the value of tau is. Um, this is exactly what something like the, Sarah, uh, the Ken Palm ratings do when they say, oh, by the way, um, and home field advantage for college basketball, home field worth like 3.2 points um, for a college basketball game. That's essentially what this value of tau is telling you is that how many points is it worth? So, so they estimate that and, and are able to give that information. So that, that's the way you can deal with home field advantage. Um, 
I, I did look at this for college hockey as well, and I had I had a lo long time series of data. So I actually estimated different home ice advantages for different teams. It was really interesting. Um, the University of Maine had the biggest home ice advantage, and that was interesting because um, the University of Maine is located 450 miles north of Boston, Massachusetts, in the middle of nowhere in Maine. And so I don't think teams that wanted didn't like taking the bus ride up to, to Maine. And so that might be the reason why they, especially in the middle of winter. So that's the reason why they had such a big home ice advantage. Um, Princeton University actually had a negative home ice advantage. They actually performed worse at home than they did on the road. And I don't have any reason why that is. Um, it was very consistent though. It was over five, 10 years worth of data that, that they, they performed worse at home than they did on the road. So that was an interesting result. There were actually a couple teams that did that, which is a possibility. Uh, a lot of models just assume that home, uh, home ice or home field advantage is the same for all, all teams um, and all places. But, but when you think about it, different teams have different, different uh, advantages and you can actually model that, which is neat. Um, margin of victory, margin of victory is tough. Um, the NCAA for the longest time has said, don't take into account margin of victory. Um, because you don't want, you don't want to encourage teams to, uh, to, to, to run up the score. And so that, that can be, that can be interesting. Um, I have a issue with it, especially in low court, low scoring sports, because a hockey team is a hockey team that wins three, one, um, really better than a team that beat another team two to one, um, especially in hockey, when you have an empty net goal or whatever, I mean, this, the, the, the difference in points might not be as important as it in maybe as in a football game. So it can be really, it, it's tough. Um, a lot of the models that I've done don't include margin of victory just because it's, it's, it's debatable about whether or not you should include it in there. Um, as I said, you know, in a basketball, maybe margin of victory mean, makes more sense. But again, sometimes, you know, college basketball games can be in the 50s. Next one is in the hundreds. And so how do you compensate for that? So it's kind of a, a strange thing to talk about. Um, you can add margin of victory to Bradley Terry. Um, essentially, one way to do that is if the margin of victory is equal to one. So you just win by the smallest possible margin. The result counts as a one as one win. Um, but as the margin of victory increases, the result counts as more than one win. And so um, what you need to do is pick some constant K. And so, you know, if you win by 10 points, that means it's really worth like 1.5 wins. If you win by, um, you know, 20 points, it's worth, you know, 1.7 wins, something along those lines. So you have to have a formula that adjusts for the number of wins the margin of victory is worth. And the point is you have to have some level where those, where that margin of victory just levels out and goes to nothing. Because if you win by 20 points or 40 points, who really cares if you've, you've maxed it out? And so there's a formula you have to develop for that. But that's how you can kind of include margin of victory in Bradley Terry. So we're, that's one way of doing it. Again, there's multiple ways to do that. And that's what those different rating systems, they do that in unique ways. And so, and so they have to figure out what the effects of those, those wins are. Um, and so I'm gonna end here. I know I've, I, I wanna leave a few minutes for questions. Um, just kind of show you that, that you can do this at, at many different levels. And so here's my example. Um, Erie, Erie, obviously located in Pennsylvania. Um, the high school sports system is, is based on districts. Erie County is in District 10. Um, and so I'm going to look at the results for the 2019 uh, District 10 boys soccer. Um, I'm especially interested in this because uh, my son was playing soccer at the time in one of the schools that is going to be listed here. Um, and so there's 33 teams, um, which they played each other in 252 games, um, spread across four different sizes of schools. And so there's some big schools and there's some small schools, and we'll kind of see how that works. Um, and since this is soccer and ties are, are an option, um, a ties count as half a win and half a loss. And that, that, that makes sense. Um, and just to keep things simple, I'm not going to include some type of home field advantage. I think college, uh, high school soccer probably isn't much of a home field advantage, although I would admit that uh, my son's um, uh, soccer team played their games on a grass field in the middle of grapes. And so it was probably the worst field in the league. So maybe that was a home field advantage, but we're going to ignore that in this particular example. Um, now, the interesting thing is you have to scrape the data from a website. And so um, I scraped this data from um, a local newspaper's website called goberry.com. And so they had all the results in there. So I wrote a little code to scrape all the data off there. I wasn't gonna enter all that data in by myself. And so, and so we entered the computer into a spreadsheet. And so to show you what this looks like. Um, and so this is very similar to the example we did before, except now I have 200 or I have 253 games. So there's lots of games, okay? And you can see all of them that are on there. And so this is just a, a same exact thing. I do this on two pages to make it a little bit easier. This is that function that we're trying to maximize. Notice I start everybody off at, at 100. 
and we can hit the solver button on this and we can let it go. Now, you'll notice that in our previous example, this was a relatively quick process, but now we've got 33 teams and 253 games. So as you adjust each one of these team values for the teams, that, that makes an adjustment for all the other games. And so this is a much harder problem. And so it's not gonna take forever. It's gonna take um, a, a couple more seconds here until it comes up with an answer. But, but obviously the more, the more games you add, the more teams you have, the harder this is to become. I'll also point out that Excel is really, really slow. Um, there are other ways you can, there's other, you know, you could write this in C++ or use other packages and this would be much, much faster. But it, the nice thing about Excel is you can actually do this and, and pretty much get answers relatively quickly as I am waiting for this to go. Okay, there we go. So now it's done. Okay, oops. And, um, and so now it has, it has done the individual ratings for each team and I've already sorted them here. And so here they are sorted. Okay. Um, Cathedral Prep is our local powerhouse athletic prep school. Um, their ranking is 1,005. Wow. They pretty much beat everybody all the time. And that's indicated. Okay. Um, and so you can see they go down. Now, one, again, one thing to remember is that in Erie County, we have lots of different size schools. Cathedral Prep, McDowell, Erie, those are our biggest schools. So they definitely have higher ratings. Um, when you go down here, um, some of these schools, when they played, didn't actually win any games. And so they have values that are equal to one. And so that's pretty rough. Um, my son played for the Northeast Great Pickers. And so his team's rating was 18.8, .8, but he played teams that were in this region. Um, by the way, um, one of the teams they played is Mercer's Prep, and that was one of the, I actually borrowed these two numbers um, from that run. I said it was 139 and uh, 18 when I gave the example earlier. That's where I drew the numbers from, and so you can see what those rankings are, but this is what you can do with it. Local system, you know, just, just high school soccer games. Can you, can you create ratings like you do, like you see for NCAA basketball? Yes, you can. Relatively simple model, spend some time in a spreadsheet, and, and you, can, you can create these rankings as well. So, um, and then again, you can make it more complicated by adding in margin of victory, home field advantage, things like that. And you can develop some really interesting, complicated systems. But, but that's just kind of a brief introduction of how you can do this. All right, I have talked way too long. Um, so hopefully people are still here. Hey, look, people are still here. I thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, I'll take any questions. If you